Hello, good afternoon. Sorry to interrupt your lunch, but please, uh, please feel free to continue eating uh, as we start the program. Uh, we have a very packed program, so we're going to be combining uh, uh, speaking with, with lunch. Uh, I'm Jason Marzak. I'm Director of Policy at the America Society and Council of the Americas, and I'd like to first welcome everybody to today's lunch um, that really comes at a pivotal moment uh, for Minneapolis, St. Paul, and frankly for the nation as Congress and now the House of Representatives considers its next moves on immigration reform. For those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, the America Society Council of the Americas, we are the uh, premier international business organization and Center for Policy Analysis of the Americas, founded by David Rockefeller nearly 50 years ago. And we've been working for the past six years to create opportunities for business leaders and policymakers to raise awareness of the positive uh, contributions that can result from changing demographics in cities all across the United States, including cities like Minneapolis and St. Paul. And our lunch today is just one of many events that we're doing here in Minneapolis on this issue, including a, a roundtable, a tour of some immigrant neighborhoods, and other, other uh, events. And it follows public events and private roundtables that we've been doing in various other new immigrant gateway cities, including New Orleans, where we have a uh, representative from the Committee of 100 there and a representative from the Louisiana State Legislature who are joining us for lunch today, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, where we have a representative from the Chamber of Commerce in Charlotte and a representative from the Charlotte City Government here. Atlanta, Georgia, where we have a representative from Mayor Reed's, Mayor Kasim Reed's here, office here, uh, as well as um, a former senator from the state of Georgia, and other cities. And in each of these cities, we are working to foster increased public-private awareness and collaboration on immigrant integration with an eye towards some of the best practices and lessons learned in New York City, where we're headquartered. And we're very lucky the Commissioner of Immigrant Affairs for the City of New York, Fatima Shama, is here with us as well, as well as Karen Kaminsky from the New York Immigration Coalition. Today, um, today we will be uh, discussing the opportunities that immigration reform would bring to the Twin Cities area. And we are very delighted that Mayor Rybeck and St. Paul Deputy Mayor Paul Williams have taken time from their very busy schedules to join us and share their perspectives on the issue. Thank you, Mayor Ryback and Deputy Mayor Williams for coming today. As well, we are also very pleased that former U.S. Secretary of Commerce and now Chairman of Republicans for Immigration Reform, Carlos Gutierrez, has traveled to Minnesota, Minneapolis specifically to speak today on why reform is so crucial. Secretary Gutierrez is one of the leading national voices on why immigration reform must be reached. Thank you, Secretary, for coming today. And you will hear from uh, Mayor Ryback, Deputy Mayor Williams, and the Secretary Gutierrez throughout this lunch. As all of you know, with the Senate passing bipartisan comprehensive immigration reform and the House now weighing its options on immigration, this lunch could not have come at a more pivotal moment. Where does reform at a national level stand today, and what would its passage mean for Minneapolis-St. Paul? How would congressional action impact the area's businesses, civic community, and policymaking community? These are all some of the issues that we're going to look at today as part of our lunch. As well, there are many facts and figures out uh, on immigrants and the economy, many of which we've consolidated, and they're also available at the uh, information table as you came in as part of ASCWA's monthly Get the Facts series. So I encourage all of you to pick up, these de pick up information on these details. Uh, these are fact sheets on why immigrants are critical for the economy, why immigrants drive entrepreneurship, why immigrants are critical for filling the skills gaps in the labor force, why immigrants are critical for the housing market, uh, actually, research that we've done with the uh, Mayor Bloomberg's Partnership for New, New American Economy uh, that finds that $3.7 trillion in housing wealth is created through the immigrant population in the United States. As well, this launch is being supported by a generous grant from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, uh, which is supporting our efforts all across different cities across the United States. Our first speaker today 
is Mayor Rybeck, who I first met when the New York City Commissioner of, of Immigrant Affairs, Fatima Shama, uh, brought mayors from across the country to a full day conference on immigrant integration at Gracie Mansion in April uh, that was actually uh, headlined with, with Mayor Bloomberg. Uh, she had about 15, 20, maybe even more, Fatima, more mayors come from all across the country, including Mayor Wilson from, from Brooklyn Center, who's here with us today. And uh, as part of that conference, it, it was I was immediately impressed with Mayor Ryback's deep commitment to immigrant integration and his insight as to why the city's efforts to achieve integration are so crucial for Minneapolis in the 21st century. As most of you know, Mayor Ryback has served as the mayor since 2001, and over the past 12 years, he has had many accomplish accomplishments, uh, implementing in innovative fiscal reforms, closing the city's employment gap, launching a 311 system, and the list goes on and on. But importantly for today, he is also a leader who understands why immigrants are criti critical for the city's economic and civic future, and has worked tirelessly across the city government to ensure that Minneapolis can truly maximize the contributions of its diverse immigrant populations. After the mayor speaks and takes a few questions, uh, Luz Frias of the Minneapolis Foundation will introduce St. Paul Deputy Mayor Paul Williams, who has also done excellent work in the city of St. Paul on helping to integrate its very diverse immigrant populations. And following that, our board member, Renati Rennie, uh, Renati is chairman and president of the Tinker Foundation. She will introduce Secretary Gutierrez, and after the secretary speaks, I will then sit down with him for a brief discussion, and then we will leave plenty of time for questions and answers for the audience. Uh, we, we're lucky that Mayor Ryback, Deputy Mayor Williams, and the secretary have all agreed to take a few questions uh, from, from you during, during their, after their presentations. So I'd like to first off, uh, please join me in welcoming Mayor, Mayor R.T. Uh, Ryback. Thank you for that really wonderful introduction and for all the great work you guys have done. We just so appreciate having you here. And I, I really want to give a shout out to Fatima uh, Shama from New York, who leads the immigration uh, issues there and did a fantastic, fantastic uh, conference that so many of us met at. So thank you so much for that work. And Secretary, it's critically important to have your voice uh, so loud and clear at this time. So we really, really want to thank you. A couple of quick introductions. A couple of members of my city council are here. Uh, who've been deeply engaged in this work. Councilmember Robert Lilligren. Councilmember, let me give a stand there. That's some Councilmember Meg Tuthill. Councilmember Elizabeth Glidden. Thank you, have there. And a number of members of our staff, if I started naming, I couldn't get all of them, but I really, really want to thank everyone uh, for being here. I also want to give a shout out to Mayor Tim Wilson of uh, Brooklyn Center, who was at that conference in New York. Thank you, Mayor. It's critical to have your whole role here. I want to start off by embarrassing somebody, if I could, if you don't mind. Um, Victor Cedeno, can I, you can put down your photograph there and stand up and give us away. Um, when Victor, I'm going to embarrass you, and I hope you'll deal with it. You can sit down. I won't make you stand during all this. But when Victor was 12, his family moved from the Dominican Republic. You didn't speak any English at the time. Came to Des Moines. He went to school. They realized Victor had some pretty good gifts in, in, uh, in school and in many other places. He went to college. He went to Harvard, to the Kennedy School of Government. He got an Ash Fellowship. He came to work as an intern in our office last year, everybody in the entire city government said, wow, we want to hire him. Because I'm the mayor, I got to hire him. Victor is now on our staff. Victor is leading uh, our budget discussions. He obviously was the organizer for this effort and is doing much more. I would say for the United States of America, immigration paid off in the case of Victor. Sorry to embarrass you, Victor, but thank you for immigration in this country. And Victor is not to be confused with the valedictorian of Roosevelt High School this year, who also came when she was a teenager from Somalia, speaking no English. And she is the valedictorian, and she's going on. He, she, is, she and Victor are not to be confused. Three of our urban scholars who are in the room at this time. This is part of a program we have in the city. 
that takes talented young people in college. Uh, is Muna Ahmed here? Muna, stand up and give us a wave. Oh, there you are, Muna. There he is. So, Muna. Muna's family is from Yemen. Is Jessica Patino here? Jessica, where are you? Jessica's family is from Ecuador. Uh, uh, Ahmed Abdullah, Ahmed, where are you? You were out at the table, I think I saw it. Right back there, there you are, uh, whose family is from Somalia. I could go on and on and on with that because you happen to be in a city that has benefited dramatically from immigration. 15% of the residents of our city are from immigrant families. That compares to 12% across the country and 7% in Minnesota. But what have we done with that? One of the most powerful things that's happened is that this city, I believe, has shown to people around the country exactly what it means to develop an asset-based way of looking at immigration. I was uh, elected in the wake of 9-11. I literally won the primary on 9-11 with a large Somali population, with a large Islamic population. I was given messages from people in the administration at that time in Washington that we should be very, very afraid of what the diversity meant in our population, we said we're not going to do it that way. So we drilled down to a lot of ways to really make sure that things worked. One of the great things we did is we recognized that members of the Islamic faith have different traditions and religious uh, beliefs that involve loans, and it made it very difficult to get our small business loans. Bob Lind, who sits here, give him a wave, who works in our small business fund, worked with the African Development Corporation, developed a way for people of the Islamic uh, faith to take a business loan. There are now 64 businesses in the city, primarily women-owned, that are small businesses that are operating solely because this city government and members of the community worked as a community, listened to the community, and got things done. That's been happening all throughout the city, but in nowhere is that more clear than in our step-up summer job program. We went to, this, to the business community. We said that this is a global city, that if we want to compete in a global environment, we want to invest in our young people. We got millions of dollars over many years from those businesses to invest in a global workforce. The Step Up Summer Job Program, we believe, is the best summer job program in the country. 18,000 kids have gone through summer jobs in all the best businesses in this community. And of those 18,000 kids, 50%, 9,000 of them, are from immigrant families. If you stop and think about what's happening in Africa, where China is beating our pants off in Africa, guess what? The place that will beat Africa, will beat the Chinese in Africa, is Minneapolis, St. Paul. We have languages, we have cultures, that's an asset, we use it, and we're not just talking about it, we're putting money on the line and investing in all of that. And as these young people who started in Step Up many years ago now come out of college, now come into the workforce, now become part of the people who work here, this global city will move forward. Now that's not a new message here in Minneapolis. Those of you who aren't here can just go walk a block away and see the only natural waterfall in the Mississippi. It's not so natural anymore because it had to get harnessed, but the fact of the matter is that waterfall turned into uh, the power that turned this into a global powerhouse because people came from all over the world with strange names like Ryback, and they worked in the mills and buildings just right up and down this street here. And they gave the power and the muscle that then became the brain power that turned those mills into General Mills and Pillsbury and so many other global powerhouses. We were built on the back of immigrants. We were built on the back of immigrant brain power and manpower, and we need to recognize that that's exactly what's happening again. No other city in America, I think, can say what we say because our diversity is more diverse than most other places. It's because this has been a place that has welcomed people from across the world. It's because it has been a city of sanctuary that has said to people in tough times and in tough needs, you come to Minneapolis, St. Paul. If you are from a place of war, if you are from a place of famine, you come here, we'll invest in you, and now you will help us grow into a world power. That's the message of this city. Now, I'm not saying everything is pretty, and in fact, if you look at our statistics in our schools, the educational achievement gap here is the shame of this city. There is no other city in America that has a larger gap between haves and have-nots. That falls especially for our immigrant communities. We cannot accept it. It requires emergency action. It is how I view this education gap and how we must treat it. But if we can solve that problem in Minneapolis-St. Paul, 
we will be the best example anywhere. And Councilmember Lilligren and I know, as we've been to Sweden and the people from Sweden have come here and asked why immigration is working so well, we don't say to them it's perfect, but we say to them we're learning something good here. And the fact of the matter is, every person in this room has been part of it. So I want to thank you for being here. I want to have you enjoy our city. I'm especially pleased. I think tomorrow you're going to the global market. If I understand, Ramon Leon, you're out there somewhere too. Ramon, where are you? There you are over there. Ramon, who's a, I can't even begin to tell you how much great stuff Ramon has done. But one of the great things is that the key leader, he and Mike Tamale from the Neighborhood Development Center, our key partnership in developing a global market. You can go in there today and see businesses from every single part of the world. Every dollar goes into the local immigrant community and it's a great, great thing. Forever, you should be remembered for that along with multiple other things. So I just want to thank you all. Welcome to Minneapolis, St. Paul and have a great time. And the mayor has graciously offered to take a few questions. So if you have a question, please signify by raising your hand. And we have microphones uh, going around the room. And if there's no questions for your mayor, must, the first that, that is a, okay, I see a question up here. That, wait for the microphone coming over to you. And if you could just identify yourself, please. Hello, I'm Margaret Bienueva from um, Chicano Latino Affairs Council in St. Cloud State. So being from St. Cloud, I just wonder if you have had meetings or you have ideas about how to spread this um, notion and idea and, and reality of, of immigrant as a positive force to some of the smaller towns and cities. Sure. One of the things that is that is a uh, truism in this community is that immigration is just happening in the cities of Minneapolis, St. Paul. You obviously know that's not the case, and you're a pretty big city. When you get into smaller cities throughout Minnesota, you see the exact same thing. And I think there is, there is much greater recognition of immigration throughout the state. I don't frankly think we have yet seen that acknowledgement of the strength of it. Um, can I go to a couple superficial things? I think one of the things that we have to recognize is this idea of getting to an asset-based workplace is a very important thing. I wouldn't ignore the seemingly superficial issues that get people there. What breaks down barriers the most? We're at lunch, food, right? The easiest way to, to understand this issue is through food. Gosh, on the main street of Marshall, I can get great Mexican food. Highly superficial, but is part of the getting there. The arts are a great, Breakdown. The Mosaic Arts Festival we had here has been part of it. There's obviously nothing that compares, though, to the issue of getting into the more, much more important nuts and bolts pieces of that. But the fact of the matter is, I think if anybody wonders what immigration means for this country, show them Japan. Show them Japan, an incredible country with phenomenal assets, whose future is very, very tenuous because it is aging so rapidly. And look at the fact that the population that's growing in this state is younger. Talk to your business leaders and have them make the case that we're making, which is pretty simple. They all get it. We're running out of workers, and the places where we have the greatest needs are among the populations that are falling most in the achievement gap. So I tend to walk them through a continuum, um, but I think the fact of the matter is those names of those young people I just pointed out are probably the best single example. So, yeah. Is there another question? We'll, we have time for one other question if there is one. Otherwise, please join me in thanking Mayor Ryback for his excellent comment. Thank you. Mayor. In addition to the city of Minneapolis, we're partnering in today's lunch with the uh, Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, the uh, Chica Chicano Latino Affairs Council, uh, Business Ford, and the Minneapolis Foundation. And I'd like to ask Luz Frias from the Minneapolis Foundation to please come up. Thank you, Jason. My name is Luz Maria Frias, and I serve as Vice President of Community Impact for the Minneapolis Foundation. Paul Williams is the Deputy Mayor for St. Paul, so you might be asking yourself, so why is she up there, right? Uh, because we go back a, a ways, uh, at least 20 years or so, when he first recruited me into the field of philanthropy when he served as a program officer for the St. Paul Foundation. And for as long as I've known Paul, 
He has focused his career on creating partnerships and building community in a variety of roles. And most recently, before taking on the deputy mayor's position, he served as senior vice president of field strategies and development for the local initiative services corporation at the national level. That experience positioned him well in his current appointment as Deputy of Mayor of St. Paul, where he has served since November 2010. Fortunately for me, our paths continue to cross and have continued to do so for the past 20 years. Most recently, as I served as part of Mayor Col Coleman's cabinet in St. Paul, where we worked side by side. Deputy Mayor Paul Williams is well known in the community because of the work that he's done and he continues to do for the city and for the community as a whole. He is a man who holds down the fort in St. Paul and makes things run and, and, and be successful for the vision that Mayor Coleman has for the city of St. Paul. If you know Paul, you'll agree that everyone holds him in high regard. He's a man of integrity and a true commitment to community. It's my honor, my pleasure to, to welcome Deputy Mayor of St. Paul, Paul Williams. Thank you, Luz. I have uh, had the honor of working with Luz, as she said, for many, many years. And many folks in the room, I'm, I'm humbled uh, by all of the familiar faces. And as Mayor Ibeck mentioned, uh, a lot of folks have done some really tremendous uh, work around these issues and also kind of from this asset-based perspective, which I'll touch on here in a, in a few minutes. Um, uh, thank you to Mayor Rybeck uh, for welcoming me across the river. Um, in fact, uh, uh, some of us St. Paulites actually enjoy it over here. Uh, and I think there's, there may be two rules in politics. One is that all po politics is local, and secondly, never follow uh, Mayor Rybeck as a speaker, um, given his proclivity to, uh, to touch on everything exactly as you're going to talk about. So you gave my, my speech. Um, I do also want to say that I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here with some of my colleagues from the east side. I know uh, Ramsey County Chair uh, uh, Rafael Ortega is here, uh, the school board chair from St. Paul, Gene O'Connell is here, uh, and a lot of folks who actually cross the river quite a bit working uh, both sides of, of the river. Um, we are, for those from out of town, we are one metropolitan area. We really do operate as one vibrant community and folks from all of our communities, immigrants and otherwise, really do cross that river all the time, work in one place, live in another, socialize in another. And so it's a very dynamic place and an interesting model wherein you have, where you have a couple of, of different major city governments and figuring out how it is that you work uh, to build community and do that side by side is, uh, is an ongoing challenge. Mayor Rybeck has been a tremendous partner with Mayor Chris Coleman in, uh, in really partnering, I think, um, very effectively for the first time in many, many years here uh, in the Twin Cities. So again, I, uh, my, my thanks to, uh, to Mayor Ryback. Uh, Mayor Coleman does send his warm uh, greetings. He's actually in Washington, D.C. today uh, on National League of Cities uh, business. I think, as some of you may know, National League of Cities has made immigration reform one of their top priorities. And as Mayor Coleman uh, this year is a first vice president, next year will be president of the National League of Cities and will be carrying that commitment uh, forward. So um, he's very much engaged and interested uh, in, in all of this work. Um, for those of you know, who, uh, who know St. Paul, you'll know that uh, uh, when you think of St. Paul, you probably often think about uh, the Irish Catholic tradition in St. Paul and a kind of a Boston-like community. Um, but in fact, if you look deeper than that, you know that, in fact, as Mayor Rybeck said, our community is a community of, of immigrant uh, history. Uh, and if you look at the, uh, the historic Mexican community on St. Paul's west side, you would see that uh, crystal clear. Uh, decades of families that have lived there in a long tradition and a long connection to the migrant workers who worked along the Red River Valley, uh, who had relatives and who ended up settling uh, in and along the west side. If you look at uh, uh, some of our, uh, our Hmong community, uh, I think first or second largest uh, Hmong community in the country, that goes back to uh, the end of the Vietnam War, late 60s, early 70s, when the Hmong community really started to come to St. Paul, really reshaped uh, the city in a lot of different ways. And more recently with the Somali 
Karen, uh, Oromo communities that have um, very strong base in Minneapolis, but now have started to come into St. Paul. And so in our school district, uh, you see um, uh, you see a whole new uh, way of, of kind of interacting with that community, not only on language, but in terms of culture uh, and in a lot of different ways. So, um, so it's a strong and long history, actually, that um, perhaps doesn't get talked a lot about in the mainstream community, but in fact is at the heart of, of what we do. So looking backwards, historically, that's important because it's also important to think about what those communities have meant for the city of St. Paul, for the city of Minneapolis. And, and in St. Paul, my, my history, as Luz mentioned, is really working more in neighborhood revitalization and, and community development. In St. Paul, the east side of St. Paul, which now is starting to rebuild itself, um, without the Latino communities along East 7th Street, along Payne Avenue, uh, we, we, uh, uh, the Mexican consulate uh, located over on East 7th, again, historically white working class neighborhood immigrant communities really at the heart of the revival and the revitalization of that neighborhood. On the west side of St. Paul, as I mentioned, the historic Mexican and Latino communities uh, really building what is, I think, a fantastic uh, model of, of an inclusive, um, mixed income, mixed uh, 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 racial community where you've got a lot of different uh, communities of color coming together and really a strong base of revitalization, all of that rooted in, in the Latino uh, uh, community. If you look at um, uh, University Avenue, uh, which is where our most recent light rail line is, is going down, from connecting downtown Minneapolis, connecting uh, to downtown St. Paul and the, uh, the state capitol, um, the Hmong community um, almost on its own revitalized that street um, despite city government at times despite city government, and have really um, done tremendous work in taking that early risk as business owners, as homeowners, uh, as organizers, uh, as folks who were out on the streets. Um, literally, we owe the revitalization of University Avenue to the Hmong community, and that story repeats itself. In Minneapolis, Mayor Rybeck and I worked for years. Uh, you're going to see uh, the global marketplace, but what you don't necessarily see are all the Somali souks the marketplaces along Lake Street, um, the reclaiming of Lake Street when it was at a very difficult point in its time. It was those immigrant communities that, that provided the seed capital for the transformation and for the rebuilding of many of these communities. So as core cities, um, th this, isn't, this isn't kind of a story that's over there. In fact, it's at the heart of, of, of who we are, where we've been, and the revitalization. And it is a great model of revitalization here in the Twin Cities that you don't see in many other communities. And so that's significant. Looking forward, uh, I think as Mayor Ibeck also alluded to, when you look at the demographics of where our communities are going, um, we have no choice. I'm done talking about this as a moral issue. I think it's an economic issue and it's a workforce issue. When you think about all the discussions going on around when you think of all the discussions going around, at least in this community, around regional competitiveness, and you look at uh, how will this region compete with other regions across the country? How will we compete with Charlotte, North Carolina? Right? The, 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 the success of that depends entirely on our ability to engage a changing workforce and our ability to engage entrepreneurs and innovation in those communities. It will come from these small immigrant businesses, right? Small business oftentimes is pointed to as the source of, of longer term jobs and the innovation economy resides in smaller business. Well, increasingly those smaller businesses are in fact immigrant businesses and businesses of color. So again, we have no choice. If we want to succeed and, and stabilize as a region, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road, that's a set of investments and that's a set of values that we need to embrace right now. Again, I think Mayor Ryback touched on that beautifully. We've got many different uh, partners who help us do that and doing that in an asset-based way. The last piece I want to talk about is, uh, is some, of those, uh, some of those partners um, uh, Mayor Ibeck mentioned uh, Mike Tamale and the folks at Neighborhood Development Center who've been doing this, this work with immigrant business development for 20 plus years. Latino Economic <laughs> Development Center, uh, Ramon Leone, has been doing this work for a number of years and really starting to expand, including in outstate Minnesota, 
actually some really fantastic work. Our friends at African Development Center, uh, you know, working throughout East African communities, uh, particularly in Minneapolis, starting to come to St. Paul. Um, but a number of other cultural organizations, Clues uh, mentioned earlier, the Mexican Consulate on the east side of St. Paul, St. Paul College, our technical college. Um, if you haven't been to a technical college recently, you really ought to get out there because when you take that tour and you go and you look and you see women in burkas, right, working a computer-operated uh, 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 machinery uh, function, when you see all of these different trades, these, this is a rich source of workforce, and these are folks who stay in the city. They will come out of those positions after 12 to 18 months, earning somewhere in the neighborhood of $35,000, $40,000 as a starting salary. They are career track jobs, and they are a significant source of, of stability and, and wealth for a lot of families. So, so when we think about who our partners are, and we think about who those mainstream institutions are that need to kind of change and adapt, I really believe that those technical colleges are going to be a critical, uh, a critical piece of that work. So, so many different uh, organizations are partnered in, in, in that work here in the Twin Cities, and we've been very grateful to have them uh, over in, in the Twin Cities. Uh, just a few things in, from St. Paul um, in terms of what the, the city itself is doing. We've been working very hard on, uh, as has Minneapolis, um, on just policy issues. Uh, a big push last year to defeat the voter ID amendment uh, bill, which was a major uh, I think a major accomplishment and a major policy push by both uh, uh, city councils. Um, uh, Lose helped create um, what we call an economic inclusion strategy. So for us, tying our human rights work to our economic, uh, our minority business development uh, work and our minority outreach and, and vendor outreach work, really combining those into a, a unified and integrated approach. Um, to particularly to minority communities, but again, a lot to, um, to immigrant communities. Um, we've created some interesting pilot programs, uh, one, one called the EMS Academy, which is training uh, young persons of color, particularly, again, significant presence of, of immigrant uh, young people in the medical technical field and getting them into a paramedic track, which can help feed our fire department. But also these kids are getting snapped up the minute they come out of here and getting hired in the healthcare field. Um, again, just pilots, again, Luz did wonderful work in, in spearheading a lot of that. Pilots that really helped to, to, uh, uh, to shape some of this work and make it real uh, on the ground. Um, so, you know, we've, we've moved the ball a bit here. I think this really, as Mayor Ibeck said, this really is um, an, a very interesting laboratory and a great model. Um, I, I can't tell you how many people, as I keep looking around the room, I see so many folks who have been um, such great partners uh, in that. That's part of why things tend to work here in the Twin Cities, because we all like each other a lot and, and we kind of move around and keep working together. But that spirit of collaboration is, in fact, one of the things that, that makes it work uh, on the ground. So I thank you for inviting me here. I uh, wish you luck in your your tour and your proceedings. And uh, again, on behalf of the mayor, um, really uh, thanks for the for the work. And Deputy Williams has agreed to generously answer questions as well. So if there is any question out here that we'd like to make sure that we have answered, there are rolling microphones around. Do you want to raise your hand? Come on, we fed you. You've got enough energy in you. Come on. Okay, we see a, a question in the back. As the post-secondary, uh, this is loud. As the post-secondary institutions start seeing their enrollment levels drop and they start trying to make up for that enrollment with students of color, I haven't seen that publicized too much. Well, if I was smart, I would defer that to my colleague in Minneapolis here, Mayor Ryback, um, or Gina Connell, our, uh, our board chair in the school district. I don't know. I think that, um, I think that there are, in St. Paul, actually, our enrollment is increasing. Um, and I'm not sure what's been happening in Minneapolis. Um, both cities have a significant growth in charter schools, which plays into the market dynamics of that. Both cities have a very um, 
serious commitment to educational reform and to trying to tackle the disparities that the mayor noted um, are among, if not the worst in the country, are, are darn close to the top. So I, I hear it talked about a lot. The education debate in Minnesota and in the Twin Cities is, is quite active, quite rich. Um, the, I think over the last 10 plus years, uh, both urban school districts have grown more uh, diverse, which I think has be both been a combination of those communities growing as a percentage, but also white students and white families leaving. Um, we've got this interesting case where we actually have students of color and their families starting to make other choices. So I think it's a very uh, dynamic situation. I, uh, I think your question is about how come nobody's talking about that. Um, I think there's a lot of talk about it here, at least. Now, I might be wrong. Other folks may have a different perspective on it. Um, but again, the, the, the K-12, um, we have got to get that right, and we have got to get on it now. Now, I, I, one of the points I forgot to make in my remarks was that this is, this is self-interest here. I'm 50 years old. I'm on the tail end of the baby boomers, right? And right now we have three workers for every one retiree. And at every point in my life, the baby boomers above me have sucked up every resource that. <laughs> so by the time I get to retirement, the baby boomers will have taken up all the resources. But, but that, that ratio shift from three to one, and then it moves to one to three. One worker for every three retirees. To me, you just do the math on that. And, and that tells you where you, you gotta get after it. In K-12, technical education, uh, and in, in a lot of other areas. So. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Renati Rennie, and I'm on the uh, board of the America Society. Um, I'm also the uh, president and chairman of the Tinker Foundation, and our founder was also instrumental in starting the American Society when it was known as the Center for Inter-American Relations. So you can see how far we've gone by then. I, I, it is my great pleasure this afternoon to introduce our speaker, our keynote speaker today, Carlos Gutierrez. Many of you know him as the Secretary of Commerce under George W. Bush. Prior to that, Carlos made headlines by being the youngest CEO in Kellogg's 100-year history. He is currently the vice chair of the Albright Stonebridge Group and sits on the boards of several Fortune 500 companies. While serving in the Bush administration, Carlos was the point man for working with Congress to pass comprehensive immigration reform, a reform he sees as one of our key domestic social issues. I should point out here, I, I've been with the Tinker Foundation for over 40 years, and we've been working on immigration reform since the early 1980s. I was in Washington right before 9-11 in a private session working on immigration reform. We almost had it made, and then, it, of course, 9-11 happened, so we're starting back at the base. Since leaving the government uh, in uh, 2009, Carlos has continued his work on keeping immigration reform in the front, on the front burner. He currently cha chairs Republicans for Immigration Reform and co-chairs the Migration Policy Institute's Regional Migration Study Group. The latter group is one funded by the Tinker Foundation, and we've been funding the MPI for many, many years. I've heard Carlos speak eloquently and persuasively on immigration reform many times. As an immigrant himself, he left Cuba in, the, in 1960. He brings a special sensitivity and knowledge to the topic of immigration reform. My family and I immigrated from, from war-torn Europe in the early 1950s, so I too appreciate what the U.S. offers its immigrant population and just as importantly, what we immigrants have contributed to the social and economic fabric of the United States. The debate in Congress is sure to become more active and heated in the weeks leading to up to the August recess. Those of us advocating for long overdue reforms must continue to speak out. 
I know that Carlos will once again give us key insights into this whole process. Thank you. Please welcome Secretary Gutierrez. <clears throat> Thank you. Good afternoon. And it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, especially among folks who think alike when it comes to immigration reform. Um, as our previous speaker said, this is, this is primarily an economic issue. It really is about the economy. It's about our future. It's about how are we going to compete. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's become a very political issue and it's highly politicized. And, and that's where we get ourselves in trouble where we start. And if I had more distribution centers, I would hire more American citizens. Easy as that. In the meantime, she's not growing. She can't because she doesn't find, she can't find the workers. I met an owner of a, rest, of a restaurant chain, a very small restaurant chain. Um, he said, look, I've got three restaurants. This is in Chicago. Today I own three restaurants. I would own eight restaurants if I could find the workers. And if I had the workers and I opened up eight restaurants, I would hire more U.S. citizens because I would need people in management. I would need people to manage the restaurant, et cetera. But unless I have the foundation, the workers, I can't open more restaurants. You can take that example and multiply it by hundreds of thousands. And that's happening today in our economy. And what drives me crazy is that Congress must see that. They must understand it, but they're not doing anything about it. You know, they're, they're, they're trying, everyone is trying to get a political edge. Everyone's trying to get a political angle. So the new system, um, that's the key thing. And people can tell you they've reformed the system because of the border, because of the 11 million, because of, if the new system isn't right, we are going to continue to have a problem. So when I hear someone say, let's pass this bill so that once and for all, I become very suspicious. There is no once and for all unless we do it right. And we do it right, you know, once now. And we realize that immigration is not something to do every 30 years. It's got to be done at least once a year and maybe twice a year. So. The good thing about the bill is that it contemplates a commission made up of cabinet officers who um, are charged with updating those quotas. So if the economy is doing a little bit better or if agriculture is complaining that we don't have enough people, then they would increase the quota. So at least there's a mechanism to look at it and not just forget about it for 20 years. And then in 20 years, Congress screams, God, we got to secure the border. And when the real problem was that Congress didn't do their job by not updating the laws. So the last thing is, um, what do you do about the 11 million undocumented? Um, I, you know, I think from the very beginning, we have said uh, we're not going to deport 11 million people. Uh, you know, round them up and put them on 747s or on buses, and then you get into the complexities of those 11 million, or part of those 11 million, about 3 million are children, who are either born here or were brought here at a very early age. Are you going to separate families? Can you imagine the photographs of 11 million people sitting in some kind of a camp at the border? We're not going to do that. Logistically, it's, it's close to impossible. But we're not also going to hand people a passport. So we've always said, hey, the solution is somewhere in the middle. And that's what I think this, this Senate bill does. Um, it, it finds that, that middle ground. Now, everybody's talking about, <clears throat> there's another political issue. They're talking about citizenship, the path to citizenship. And that unless, and the president has said this, and I wish he wouldn't have said this, Unless there is a path to citizenship, I'm going to veto it. I'm not going to sign. Well, 
path to citizenship comes in about 13 to 15 years. Um, in 1986, during President Reagan's so-called amnesty, only 41% chose to become citizens. So not everyone wants to become a citizen. A lot of people just want to work, they want to go back home, they want to come back in whenever they want. But the whole citizenship is a Washington political little debate. You know, it's we want those people to be citizens, we want them to be voters because they're going to vote for a certain party. But would we really veto a bill that gives the 11 million undocumented finally legal status so that they leave their house in the morning, go to work and know they're going to come back at night? They may not be citizens, but they've got a legal status they can redo every six years. And they may not be citizens, but their kids are going to be citizens. You don't think they'd be better off that way than to say, well, since they didn't give me the option of being a citizen in 15 years, I'd rather stay here illegally and know that one day I'm going to be deported. Of course not. But there you see the, you know, the politics getting in the way of doing what is right. Um, and that's going to be an interesting one <clears throat> to see who works. <clears throat> I favor citizenship. I think it's the right thing to do, but I don't think it's a make or break issue. And I don't think it, it should be something to bring the whole bill down. I mean, in any event, we've got 13 to 15 years to figure it out. Uh, but I think it would be a terrible injustice to the people who are waiting to just hear, to be here legally who have done a heck of a lot of work. And I'll tell you something, we should be grateful that they're here because this economy without 11 million people would have been in deep trouble. And um, again, who made the laws? Who's accountable for those laws? We're all accountable. We're all, it's business who hired, it's Congress who didn't do the laws, it's the guys at the border who turned the other way. And all of a sudden, it's, you know, it's no one's problem. Um, or we've got to deport these guys because it's their problem. Even though we brought them in and we convinced them and we told them and we, you know. So um, in, in that regard, it's a little bit disappointing, to be honest. Um, anyway, I think that uh, we have been good at this since the very beginning. Uh, Countries become xenophobic. We in the U.S. have had our times when we have become um, suspicious of strangers, xenophobic, nationalist. We didn't like people from other countries. We didn't like people with funny last names. We didn't like, we go through that. We went through that in the 1920s. But in the end, wisdom always prevails. And what it tells me is that today we are living in a moment of insecurity because when we're at our best, when we're secure in who we are and what we're looking for, we welcome people in. And not only do we welcome them in, we celebrate their success because that's our success. And it's been how this country has become the greatest country in the world. So if we get this right, the 21st century is all about the U.S. And I'll tell you something, no one's gonna catch up. China, forget it. China also has a demographic problem. If we get this wrong, shame on us, because we know how to do it. We've done it before. This is who we are. So I would just ask each of you, please, whatever you can do, you have no idea what a phone call into your member of Congress does. Because those, in, in 2006, that's how we lost. There were more calls against than there were in favor. So do your part. This is good for the country. I, you know, there's a political angle to this. But before you get to the political angle, this is good for the country. This is good policy. This is good for our economy. So I can't thank you enough for your leadership, for your foresight, for your courage. Uh, we're going to look back one day soon 
and realize that all of you were on the right side of history. And I appreciate that. And I thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Well, Secretary and I are gonna have a brief, brief conversation. First of all, I wanna thank you for those excellent, excellent remarks. Um, I think that those, the numbers you put out there on immigrants' contributions uh, to the economy overall, but specifically different industries, whether it's agriculture, construction, those are all numbers that the folks here in this room, many of which are, are supportive of immigration reform, those are numbers that you need to share with your communities, and those are numbers you need to share with local press, uh, because, because as, as the Secretary said at the end, uh, immigration reform will only pass because of people in local communities make, helping to make it pass. Um, I want to start off, you, you mentioned briefly that there is, I think you said there is some chance that we'll get some components of reform in the House. Can you specify a little bit? What, do you, what is your outlook on what we should, we should expect from the House? You, you, did a, you, you presented the Senate bill, which is very comprehensive, provides a very robust uh, compromise between the two parties, but what are we, what are we expecting from the House? I, mean, I, I think what they'll probably do is start out with border security, which is a favorite topic. So. Uh, make sure that the border security is right, that we've done all the, um, and, 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 and adjust the Senate's border security uh, part of the bill. <clears throat> we'll probably get a DREAM Act, which I think is a pretty straightforward one. <clears throat> um, we could get an ag bill because that's so important that there's some ag states that absolutely need that. Um, you know, the easy one is the high skill. <clears throat> H-1B. I think what they'll probably leave to the end is what do you do with the 11 million undocumented? And it's going to come down to that. And the question is whether the Senate wants to vote, wants to accept the piecemeal approach even though they don't know what's coming at the end. And that's the part that is going to be very difficult to reconcile. But I, I think this, you know, this tough issue of path to citizenship, what do you do with the 11 million, I think that will be left toward the end. And ironically, that's the part that, you know, that has made this so controversial. So, you know, the final answer won't come to the end, and I think that's going to uh, slow things down quite a bit. So, I'm, I'm, you know, I would have said 50-50. I think it's more like 40, 60, or maybe 30, 70, that we get something substantially enough, say, in 2014. And August recess is coming up, which has traditionally been a time when members, House members will go back to their districts, and some of the uh, uh, more probably extreme elements of, of constituencies will, will voice their concerns uh, about whatever legislation is on the agenda at that point. Right now is immigration reform. Um, what, what should we expect to happen during August recess, and how can how can folks, especially folks here in this room, I mean, there's looking at the, the congressional delegation here in Minnesota. There's um, you know a uh, you know, there's folks who are both in favor of immigration reform, folks who are not, folks who are sitting on the fence. Um, what can what can folks here do to, to raise momentum? You know, <clears throat> an interesting thing that that has happened in the country is <clears throat> throughout over time because of uh, redistricting and gerrymandering and, you know, there are districts that are Republican districts, there are districts that are Democrat districts. So the, the people in those districts are worried more than anything else, the members, about a primary challenge. So they're all going back and they're, they're hearing, do I have a primary challenge on my hand? Who is it? Um, and in many cases, the primary challenger will be from their right or from their left. So if they're supporting immigration, the primary challenger will be out there screaming amnesty, amnesty. So the problem with these August recesses is that's when members go back home and they hear from people who are engaged in the topic. Now. I think that most of us in this room are probably either center left or center right, but we're somewhere within a center. It's the people on the extremes that are involved. 
I've never seen a demonstration of people picketing for moderation. You know, we just go about our huh? We go about our lives and we do what have we have to be done. And but but the people who who believe passionately in extremes are involved every single day. They're calling their member of Congress. They're sending letters. So what what you can do is. Um, is take a page out of their book and talk to your members of Congress. Get a letter writing campaign going. Get 200 of your friends to write a letter or to sign a letter. Uh, but those are things that members of Congress are paying attention to. Um, we're, we're investing, by the way, in, in, in little uh, ways of technology of being able to call someone and say, if you're in favor of immigration, Press this button, that'll get you into your congressman's voicemail and leave him a message. So, you know, there are ways of doing that, but that's how we got beat in 2006. Um, and I would hope that we prevent that uh, this time around. So, let's inundate the, ph the phone lines. Inundate, inundate, inundate the phone lines, the talk to them, talk to your friends, talk to them about what's at stake. My sense is that most people don't really know what's going on, people don't have the time to get into you know, this 800 page bill. Um, and, and most people, I mean, immigration reform, yeah, it's something about a path to citizenship, you know, and it's so much more. And it's so much more complex than that. Um, and, and it is so essential for our economy. Uh, another question for the secretary, but also after that, we're gonna open up to questions from the audience. We're, about, we're running about five minutes late. We're gonna um, probably run about 10 minutes late. So just think of your questions. Um, as I'm asking this next question, but I think, you know, one of the challenges with moving reform forward in the House now is to, it seems to be somewhat of a disconnect uh, between leaders in the Republican Party, such as yourself and others, and some of the, some rank and file members who are worried about, as you were saying before, challenges in their primary districts. Um, and, and also being labeled as quote unquote soft on, on, on immigration. How can that divide be, be addressed uh, between the leadership and between some members in the, in, the, in the party who are worried about the primary challenges? Well, <clears throat> I think one thing is, is that we, uh, around the country, we give uh, Republicans who are concerned about a primary challenge, that we give them some cover. And we support them. And we don't let the primary challenger win. And, and we support the person who supported reform. I think that is a um, an important aspect. What you know, what, what you don't want is someone goes out there and supports reform, and all of a sudden they lose because a primary challenger takes advantage of that. Yeah. I think we should be engaged. We should know who's running, who voted for, who voted against, who has a primary challenger. Uh, those types of things. I think we just need to be a lot more engaged in the process. And, and, and give people who want to do the right things, give them cover. Yeah. Excellent point. Uh, we have time for a question or two. Um, I'll take, actually, we'll take, we'll take both these questions together. Uh, Renati, and then a question at the other table. Thank you. Uh, I was listening to all the talking heads this weekend, and many of them said that this immigration reform uh, issue would be more productive if President Obama actually participated more actively. Uh, you mentioned that this is an economic issue. Would you s see greater participation and advocacy by President Obama as a plus or a negative in moving the reform for forward? Any other questions? Well, my question, uh, Mr. Secretary, you mentioned the uh, 1986 and, and Reagan, well, that was, that was actually an amnesty program. It was marketed as amnesty. I, have, I personally had a family member who didn't go and take advantage of that, as did millions. So I think, we, I think we can say it was disappointing, the turnout. But now we have a, a, uh, an opportunity for the 11 million. What happens if their turnout isn't there? What, what does that say about the opportunity now, after the, and, and all these people in the room are fighting for that, what happens then? 
You, you mean the turnout as in how many wanted to become the, citizens? The, because because if, from what we hear from the politicians, it's very simple. Well, you turn yourself in, you pay oh, your I fine, yeah, you, yeah. You, you pay your back taxes, and then you have to do this and that. You have to, what, what happens? Because we don't know what those 11 million are going to turn themselves in. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that's a very What, what happens then? What are the repercussions? The next step. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's that's a very key question, and I'll, I'll be back to that. Um, on the president's engagement, I, I would say you know it's it's tough for the president to be there every day and negotiating. And uh, I think they should have someone from the administration uh, present because uh, right now it's really been the Senate and the group of the Senate. Uh, so, you know, under President Bush, not that we are successful, but we had the Commerce Secretary and the Homeland Security Secretary. Um, that wouldn't be bad because they, they can add value. Um, you know, during the meeting, somebody would turn to Chertoff and say, hey, can you do this? Is this realistic? Um, and, and Chertoff would say, no, I can't, or yes, I can. I mean, it was just a way of making sure you had a bill that, that, that was workable and that the president's points of view were on the table. Um, so I think it's a shame that he's not involved. I also think that there's, you know, there's a two-sidedness to this, that when he is involved, people criticize it. When he's not involved, people, you know, so he's a little bit in a, uh, he's a little bit in a jam, but I, I wish he had people there from the administration instead of just stepping back and letting the Senate do the whole thing. Another question. Any other questions? We'll take the one. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, what was the question here? Was on, uh, 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 yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I, I, it, it's a great question. So you want there are 11 million people, and the idea is to say, okay, come forward and tell us who you are that you came here without documents. Um, we're gonna do a background check on you. So that means that you may not get legalized. Uh, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna put you through it and, and then we'll let you know what your status is. Uh, so people with a background check won't come forward. Uh, some people will be nervous and will be uh, distrustful. Uh, I remember in 06, we were trying to make it very clear that any information that you submit to get your application done will, cannot be used for tax purposes, cannot be used for anyone else. But even there, people are suspicious. People are nervous. So I think that's a key point. We're not going to get 11 million people registering, but I would say that the ones that don't register those are the ones who we should find out where they are and talk to them because they may have something to hide. And, which is another part that people tend to, uh, to dismiss is that this is also good for national security because there are 11 million people in the country, and we don't know who they are. And as we used to say, we'd rather have the Homeland Security folks and our best and brightest be going after drug dealers and criminals instead of going after gardeners and people who work in hotels, you know? Um, but I think that's, I, you've identified, you know, w one of the executional problems that we're gonna run into. <coughs> the, the last question, quickly. I'm more granular, but my name is Reginaldo Hazle Marroquin. I live in Northfield, south of here. And we are concentrated on farmers and especially immigrant farmers who want to become part of the food system as producers who own and control their systems. So here's the profile. But 85% of everybody who comes to our program are undocumented. Very small percentage um, from the other 15% actually have the qualities and characteristics needed to succeed in this sector. Um, we have a $30 million regional project that we need to deploy in the next three to four to five years. That requires that we engage 125 new Hispanic farmers. And currently, we are carefully watching what's going to come out of this so that we can equip, prepare, strategize, 
in all of those things, you know, retool to respond. So, in specific terms, what should we be preparing for based on your understanding of what's going to come out and how that's going to change that profile that I just described? You mean it, with, with the new bill? <clears throat> yes, there is something we have to expect out of it. I'm not saying one or another, but that profile, you know, from that 80%, uh, should we expect that more people would become eligible to be able to fully integrate into these systems? Um, that's where I, we depend on. If there's no clarity at that level, we can't strategize. Our organizations don't grow because, yeah. because we have to prepare well, for that. <clears throat> based on the numbers, 110,000, uh, my prediction would be that you're, you're going to continue to have trouble. Um, you're going to continue to have to scramble to get enough people until people realize that you're not playing games and that you really do need the people and that we really do need the immigration. Um, I think you'll be a little bit better off than today, um, but you're still going to have bureaucracy because the, the, the big thing is, is the government doesn't trust business. So they need, therefore, we need four or five agencies to be monitoring this. We need, uh, and you know how that is. So um, I, I don't, I, even if we pass a bill, we're still going to have an imperfect bill. And you're gonna be, you, you're gonna be pushing this for the next several years. And, 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 and that's the important thing is after, if this bill goes through this year and we have a comprehensive immigration bill, we're still going to have a lot of work to do to make sure that the immigration system serves the economy. So it's not going to be over with this bill, and especially for agriculture, because people just don't, unless you're in agriculture, they just don't get why agriculture is so different, special, and requires, um, you know, almost special attention. And one of the things that we've, we've talked about in cities around the country, including with, uh, with uh, Commissioner Shama in New York, is the importance of cities and the importance of cities and being able to facilitate immigrant integration. At the federal level, we need immigration reform, but it really comes down to the cities to be able to actually integrate the immigrants and be able to really maximize the contributions that immigrants yeah. make. Um, I want to, again, uh, thank all of you for coming, uh, spending lunch with us. Uh, I want to thank the uh, Secretary for your excellent, excellent comments. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Mayor Ryback, uh, Deputy Mayor Williams, for your, your excellent, uh, excellent comments as well. And again, all of our partners who have work, worked with us tirelessly through this, uh, the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, uh, Bill Blazer, uh, the uh, city of Minneapolis, not only the mayor and his office, but Bob Lynn, Victor Cedeno, and others, uh, the Chicano Latino Affairs Council, Hector Garcia, uh, the Minneapolis Foundation, Luz Frias, and Business Forum.